First of all, it's a, a pleasure to be here and I uh, want to thank the organizers for the invitation to come here and to speak. Uh, and although I know that he could not be here for the talk, I also want to thank Nicola for organizing the uh, beautiful hike uh, yesterday. Uh, and and uh, to Herbert for finding all those nice uh, uh, shortcuts. Uh, <laughs> um, so, my talk uh, is not going to be focused on a, uh, on a specific result, but uh, it's going to be more um, my attempt to, to present to you a story. And uh, along this, this story, there will be some results, but I will not uh, emphasize those results so much. Uh, so um, to, to give you sort of a... a uh, bird's eye view of, uh, of what I want to tell you about. Let me begin with the broadly a class of problems, which I'll call geometric dispersive PDEs. And I'll, I'll uh, tell you more about what equations I have in mind. But for now, let me just say that uh, one uh, feature that all of these geometric dispersive PDEs share is uh, um, some, um, some gauge invariance. In other words, uh, for all of these equations, for each of these equations, you have some gauge group. Uh, and this uh, gauge group means that uh, you have an extra family of symmetries that applies to your equation. Uh, and so when you look at the solution, you don't think of that as a single solution. You think of it more as an equivalence class. So uh, given an arbitrary solution, you can look at all its gauge transforms, and those give you other solutions. And all of these guys are equivalent to each other. And they, you could make this so that they even share the initial data if you think of evolution equations. And so obviously that's not a class of well-posed problems from a PDE standpoint. In PDEs, when we talk about a well-posed problem, you want to say, given an initial data, I have a unique solution. Well, here you obviously don't have a unique solution because you can, once you have a solution, you can transform it and get more solutions. So if you want to do PDE analysis on these equations, you have to apply a procedure which is uh, known as gauge fixing. And in a nutshell, what gauge fixing is about, you look at one equivalence class, and out of this equivalence class, you want to choose one representative. And if you make this choice well, then uh, your equation suddenly becomes, perhaps, hopefully, a well-posed uh, equation in, in, in the sense that for each initial data, you're going to have a unique solution which belongs to this uh, um, particular class that you have chosen using the, uh, by fixing the gauge. All right, and um, so, of course, uh, gauge fixing is, is, uh, is a non-trivial process, uh, and you have more than one uh, obvious choice, and you'll, you'll see more uh, choices in a minute. Uh, but one such class of choices that have, has emerged maybe um, in the last, uh, 10-15 uh, years or so, um, is, um, is the choice that uh, uh, involves uh, a geometric parabolic flows. Uh, the examples that I'm going to give in a moment are going to be hyperbolic equations. Now, if you look at hyperbolic equations, you'll know that steady states for hyperbolic equations are elliptic, uh, solve elliptic equations. And once you have some elliptic equations, you also can talk about their parabolic counterparts. And their parabolic counterparts turn out to play a role in the gauge fixing. So I'm going to uh, close the circle in here and uh, show you uh, this idea of how a geometric parabolic flow 
can lead to a good gauge fixing procedure. All right, and this, this class of gauges, we're going to call them caloric gauges. And what I want to, what I hope you'll uh, get to understand by the end of this story is why do we care about these caloric gauges, how do we use them, uh, and why, why do we need them in the first place? Because there are plenty of gauge choices which have nothing to do with the caloric gauges. Uh, and caloric gauges are intrinsically somewhat more complicated because imagine you have some equation that you're trying to solve, and in the process of solving that equation, you need to perform some procedure which is related to solving yet another equation. Um, and uh, the story gets even more complicated because once you start looking at these parabolic flows, you need to fix the gauge. Um, so there's some, uh, some reiteration going on. Um, but uh, in a nutshell, this is, this is my story. And the, the, there will be two, two equations that I want to tell you about. Uh, one is the wave map equation. Okay, and the other one is the Young-Mills equation. Both of these are hyperbolic equations. Okay, so this is hyperbolic. But as uh, the equation for the stationary states for wave maps, we'll also care about uh, the harmonic map. which are the steady state for the wave map equation. And the corresponding parabolic flow is what's called the harmonic heat flow. Um, and again, the, the picture is reflected here. So here, this is a hyperbolic equation. But you also have uh, the corresponding elliptic equation, the harmonic Young-Mills equation, and also the corresponding parabolic equation, the harmonic, the, the, the Young-Mills uh, heat flow. And so these two heat flows will be the parabolic flows that I'm going to tell you about, okay? So this is the picture that I'll try to keep on the board for as long as possible, uh, hopefully for, for the rest of the talk. And now let me quickly uh, describe these two models, uh, wave maps and uh, young males. And I'm not going to try to do things in utmost generality. So uh, here, I'll tell you a little bit about wave maps. So here you're looking at uh, maps phi uh, from uh, uh, Rn plus one, uh, R Let's call this d plus one. Uh, and we're going to think of this as the Minkowski space, okay? Uh, into some Riemannian manifold mg. For this function's phi, you measure uh, a Lagrangian very much like in the case of the constant coefficient wave equation. L of phi is equal to uh, integral over r d plus one of the um, alpha phi times the alpha phi. All right, so if you think about this, uh, derivatives of phi will be vectors in the tangent space of M. So here, this dot product is a dot product with respect to the metric M, and the integration is with respect to x and t. And so critical points, formal critical points for this Lagrangian will be called wave maps. Uh, what is the equation for wave maps? Well, if uh, this manifold were Rn, then your equation will be, uh, so the Euler-Lagrange equation 
will be uh, d alpha d alpha phi is equal to zero. So here and here indices are raised with respect to the Minkowski metric. So this is in the constant coefficient case. Now in our case, uh, d alpha phi is a vector that tangent to uh, that that belongs to the tangent space of M, and the base point moves. So you cannot look at uh, a classical differentiation. You need um, you, you can think of this uh, vectors d alpha phi as belonging to a vector bundle. So there you need some covariant differentiation. So the actual equation looks like this, where this d represents the covariant differentiation in this bundle. So here I'm trying to write the equation uh, covariantly for um, brevity, let's say. Uh, and this is nothing but uh, um, the uh, pullback of the Levi-Civita connection uh, from M uh, with respect to this map uh, phi. All right, and this is the wave map equation. It's a, a second order hyperbolic equation, so to solve this you need to assign uh, initial data. Um, so, phi zero and phi one, let's say. So the initial position and the initial velocity, uh, this uh, phi zero is a map and this phi one uh, is a, a map which takes values in the tangent space um, of M at phi zero. All right, and uh, some, some very quick considerations here. You have a conserved energy. So the conserved energy is in brief uh, integral over R D um, uh, uh, grad phi uh, square uh, dx, and this is also measured with respect to the um, uh, metric, uh, sorry, with this, I misspoke here. This is the metric G, and this is the metric G. All right, uh, you have some scaling associated to this problem. So the scaling is phi of x and t goes into phi of lambda x, lambda t. And perhaps the most uh, interesting case in here is the case uh, uh, which is the, uh, where the energy is invariant with respect to the scaling, and that's called the energy critical problem. That corresponds to the dimension being equal to two. And from here on, I'll confine my discussion to this two-dimensional problem. Now, uh, we've heard in, in several other talks uh, in this uh, conference how when you try to solve an evolution equation like this, one important thing to understand is what are the steady states of this equation. And the steady states of this equation are harmonic maps. And for harmonic maps, you have the similar Lagrangian, uh, which is integral of uh, d j of phi, uh, d j phi uh, d x. Um, and here I'm going to, and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to follow a reasonably standard convention where I'm using Greek indices for space time uh, and uh, Roman letters for just spatial uh, indices. And so uh, the equation that you get in here is simply the equation dj, uh, dj phi is equal to zero, which is a second order elliptic equation. Um, all right. Um, and um, so the question is whether you have such steady states. And what, uh, the question of whether you have such steady states seems to be tied to, uh, uh, to a little bit of, of topology, uh, namely if you're looking at maps from uh, Rd plus one to M, uh, you can ask the question whether these maps are uh, topologically trivial, in other words, whether you co can contract them to zero or not. And the image that you might have in mind in here is 
Uh, for instance, if you look at maps phi from R2 to uh, S2, uh, and if you assume that phi is essentially constant at infinity, then the question is how many times uh, this map wraps around the sphere. Um, so you can think of that as some sort of uh, winding number or homotopy class, okay? And so if you look at uh, the class of all possible maps with finite energy, uh, this uh, class of maps with finite energy in general, you can uh, split it into connected components, uh, into these homotopy classes. And within each of these homotopy classes, you can look at minimizers for this Lagrangian. Okay, so. And so within each class, you're going to have a minimizer, which is unique up to symmetries, and symmetries means uh, uh, scaling, translation, uh, scaling and, and uh, uh, translations, okay? And so depending on uh, how many homotopy classes you have, uh, uh, you're going to have a sort of a hierarchy of, uh, of ground state solutions. And of course, if you look at the trivial homotopy class, the minimizer is zero, or the constant solution. But the moment you look at the first non-trivial homotopy class, then you're going to have non-trivial minimizers. And one uh, interesting non-trivial minimizer uh, is what's called uh, a ground state. Uh, this is the smallest. non-trivial harmonic map. And let's give a name to this. Let's call this Q. And uh, the energy of this Q, which is measured using this functional, uh, will be called the ground state energy. <clears throat> and so um, at this point, I want to uh, quickly uh, state for you one of the, the main uh, theorems uh, uh, concerning uh, energy critical wave maps. Um, and this is what's called the threshold theorem. Okay, and this theorem says the following, says that the wave map equation in two, in uh, R2 plus one, in the energy critical dimension, is globally well posed for data below this ground state energy. Um, all right, so uh, in, 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 in this uh, formulation, this is a, a theorem that I proved almost 10 years ago, uh, uh, together with Sturbens. But there are also other results in this direction, beginning with the small data problem, uh, work of uh, Tao, in the case when you have the target to be the sphere, work of uh, Joachim Krieger, in the case when the target uh, uh, manifold is the hyperbolic space, and then work that I did uh, for um, uh, any any uh, compact uh, uh, target. Also for the large data problem, uh, there's uh, uh, independent work of uh, Lurman and Krieger, uh, and also independent work of Tao uh, in cases when uh, the target manifold M is the hyperbolic space. The reason the hyperbolic space plays a role in here is it's sort of the opposite of the sphere on one hand. On the other hand, in the case of the hyperbolic space, you have no such ground states. And so this uh, theorem applied to the hyperbolic space target says that uh, the wave map equation is globally well posed. So this is uh, not so much part of uh, uh, my discussion here, but it, it is sort of the birthplace, as you'll see in a moment, of, uh, uh, of this uh, caloric gauges. All right, so um, 
So far, uh, if you look at the wave map equation, there's no gauge invariance in here. Uh, the, well, I'm lying. So there is a little bit of gauge invariance. Uh, and one way you can visualize some, some sort of gauge invariance is you have a manifold and you're looking at maps into this manifold and you need to choose coordinates on this manifold to parameterize somehow this manifold. You can do this in many ways. You can work in local coordinates. You can use Nash's theorem to, if you have a, a compact uh, uh, target, to embed this into some Rn and use those uh, coordinates from, from, from that Rm, or um, um, let's see, um, I guess uh, those are, 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 are the main settings, but it's not this uh, uh, trivial gauge invariance which has to do with the choice of coordinates that I'm going to uh, address a little bit later. So let me stop here with the wave map equation and say two words about the Young-Mills equation. So for the Young-Mills equation, uh, what you have is a, a, a Lie group. So this is a, a, a compact, semi-simple Lie group. And if you're not so familiar with Lie groups, you should just think of uh, SLN, the orthogonal matrices, the real orthogonal matrices in Rn. Uh, you have small g, the corresponding uh, Lie algebra. So uh, specializing here, this would be small S O of N, uh, the algebra of uh, um, anti-symmetric uh, N by N matrices. And then you have, uh, 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 let's call it uh, X, um, a metric bundle, uh, a metric uh, vector bundle. over um, R, if you want, uh, D plus one. Uh, this will be the Minkowski space. And this X has structure group G. And so again, if you're not familiar with this uh, uh, terminology, then uh, what you should think of in a first approximation is you should think of X as being R D plus one uh, cross Rn. So on top of each point x and t in Rd plus one, you have uh, uh, a vector bundle Rn. Rn, you should think of it as being endowed with a Euclidean matrix, so very uh, straightforward. And then this uh, group corresponds to orthogonal matrices, which are the symmetries of Rn, which are compatible with, uh, um, with the Euclidean matrix. All right, and so now on this uh, vector bundle, you can talk about covariant differentiation. Uh, and uh, if you look at what's called the metric connection, uh, the covariant differentiations will have the form um, d alpha, or d alpha is equal to d alpha plus a alpha where A alpha are elements in, uh, in this Lie algebra. So this metric connection acts on functions which are defined in this vector space, uh, Rn, functions on the base which are defined uh, in this vector space in Rn, in other words, on sections of this uh, bundle. But uh, it also acts on Uh, on uh, um, G-valued functions. So that's by the formula D alpha of B. So now B is, as uh, let, let's say an anti-symmetric matrix, is D alpha of B plus A alpha B. This represents the Lie bracket in your Lie group, okay. So this is a very quick introduction to, um, to Young-Mills. Uh, now we take a Lagrangian, which is very similar to the Lagrangian we had before. Um, uh, the, the Lagrangian looks like uh, L of A is integral over R d plus one. Uh, and here uh, you have the 
uh, inner product of f alpha beta f alpha beta, where f represents the curvature associated to this connection. In other words, it has to do with commutators of covariant derivatives. And it's given by the formula f alpha beta is equal to d alpha a beta minus, minus d beta a alpha plus a alpha a beta. This is again the Lie bracket, and maybe I should have said that uh, in the case of matrices, the Lie bracket is just the commutator of uh, the two matrices. So here the Lagrangian is expressed in terms of the curvature of the connection. Um, the curvature of the connection plays the same role as the derivatives of the map uh, in here. So it's at the level of the uh, differentiated equation. And now if you look at uh, the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation here, Uh, this will have the form d alpha f alpha beta is equal to zero, and this is what I'll refer to as the hyperbolic Young-Mills equation. All right, um, so uh, two important uh, features in here. One is that you have an energy, so your energy of A is a norm of its curvature uh, in L2 square. And uh, the second feature, and this uh, leads me to, to the main uh, part of my story, is the fact that you have a curve, uh, that you have a gauge invariance. Okay, so the gauge invariance uh, uh, takes uh, A to uh, O, A alpha to O, A alpha. O inverse plus O alpha O inverse. And uh, uh, F alpha beta, this, this, is a, uh, this is a tensor, so uh, it goes to uh, O F alpha beta O inverse, where O stands for maps which are valued in the Lie group. So O is from R D plus one in your Lie group, all right? And so this transformation preserves the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation, the Young mills equation, preserves the energy. Um, and, and so this is the gauge invariance that uh, I have uh, in mind in here. Now, talking about the energy, this problem also has a nice scaling. And uh, to make a long story short, just like for wave maps, you have uh, the critical dimension four-dimensional problem. And the reason uh, that's a four-dimensional problem, uh, and this is a two-dimensional problem, is because as a caricature, this equation looks like box phi is equal to grad phi square, uh, whereas uh, as a caricature, uh, this equation looks like box A is equal to A uh, times dA. So here we have one less derivative on the right-hand side. OK. so. Uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, the Young-Mills equation, you have uh, a result that's similar to the threshold theorem here. And so the threshold theorem, again, asserts that the Young-Mills is globally well posed below ground state energy. And this is the result, uh, which is uh, joint work with the uh, Sanjin O. And we're working hard to uh, finish to finish writing this. Um, it's going to be uh, three papers, about close to 300 pages. And then uh, to make things simpler for a reader, we're also writing a 30-page page overview paper. Um, so if you want just an uh, uh, overview of it, it's enough to read that. 
Okay, and uh, here again, there's a previous work. Uh, maybe I should uh, mention the work of uh, uh, Krieger and Sturbant in uh, for small data and higher dimensions, um, and then uh, the work of Krieger and myself for um, the four plus one dimensional problem, uh, and again for for small data. This uh, threshold theorem is. Uh, if you want the corresponding large data result. Um, one thing that I don't have time to explain here very much is the topological structure. So here also, uh, just like uh, in the case of wave maps where you have this homotopy classes, here you can also introduce some, some similar uh, homotopy structure. Um, and um, so you can introduce some homotopy classes and uh, this uh, ground, the, the ground states are minimizers of the Lagrangian of the corresponding elliptic Lagrangian in those homotopy classes. So it's a perfect parallel between that problem and that problem, except that here it takes longer to explain where those uh, homotopy classes come from. All right. So now I'm going to get to, to the main point of my story, which is where uh, the caloric equations, where the caloric gauges come up. And let me begin with the um, um, uh, uh, wave map equation because this is the beginning of the story. Um, and uh, so, <clears throat> so when you, when you look at wave maps and they're saying just by looking at the equations, there's no, no obvious choice of gauge. Uh, no obvious uh, gauge invariance. And to get to this gauge invariance, what you have to do is to, to look instead at differentiated equations. And these differentiated equations are a system of equations for d alpha of phi. All right? And if you try to write down equations for d alpha of phi, uh, these equations will look like d alpha d alpha applied to d sorry d okay d beta of phi um, so this is like your wave equation okay uh, and then you have uh, uh, a, a curvature term arising from the fact that this uh, uh, covariant derivatives do not commute and that's because your manifold your target manifold has non-trivial curvature. Um, and this is something that looks like R of, uh, let's see, uh, D, um, alpha, phi, uh, phi, beta, phi, applied to D, uh, alpha, phi. I don't want to get into too many details with this. So these are vectors in the tangent space, but when we do PDs, we want to think of functions rather than objects which take values in some uh, variable vector space. So one obvious way to do this is to choose an orthogonal base in the tangent space of uh, M. And, and here I'm emphasizing that you're looking at the, at the tangent space at the point phi of x and t. So I'm making this orthogonal phrase, uh, frame depends on, depend on x and t rather than making it depend on, um, on the value of, of phi. Okay? So you cannot think of this as a frame that happens on the, on the uh, target uh, uh, manifold. It, it depends on the base point in here. All right? And once you choose this frame, you can represent phi, represent d alpha phi or d beta phi, or you represent it in, in this frame, and you get some elements psi beta, which are in R n. n is the dimension of the target manifold. So these are just the coordinates of this uh, uh, vector in the orthogonal frame. Okay? And then you can write down an equation for this psi beta. Uh, which looks very much like the uh, alpha d alpha psi beta is some curvature term and so on. But now this covariant differentiation here, my notation is a little bit misleading, is not the same covariant differentiation as here because this covariant differentiation goes through a choice of frame. And now here's your 
gauge freedom, your gauge freedom has to do with how you choose this frame. Choice of, or if you want, orthogonal frame. And so when you do this, your, your covariant differentiation, uh, the alpha will look like, uh, or the alpha will look like d alpha plus a alpha, where a alpha will be an anti-symmetric matrix. And at this point, you should already begin to see parallels with the young mills equation, because what you're introducing here really is a Lie uh, algebra uh, structure. And then your uh, uh, gauge invariance is the same as for uh, young males. So it's the one given by these relations. Um, except that here, you're going to get uh, a nice equation for the curvature. So here, the curvature is not, uh, if you want, a dynamical variable. Instead, um, your f alpha beta, which is given by the same formula as on the board on the right, um, uh, will be equal to some r of uh, d alpha, uh, if you want, r c alpha c beta for some meaning of this uh, 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 expression on the right. So it's a, what you should uh, rem, uh, observe here is you have a curvature, and this is the curvature really from the uh, manifold M. Uh, and this is a quadratic expression in psi. So the curvature is a quadratic expression. Now, you, you're going to say, well, I know the curvature, and um, I want to fix the gauge so that A is uniquely determined. And there's a number of good gauge choices. Uh, and for instance, if you look at the work of, uh, of Joachim for the case of hyperbolic uh, space uh, uh, target, uh, he, he uses uh, the Coulomb gauge, which is dj aj is equal to 0. So this is just the spatial derivatives. Uh, which is a very convenient gauge to use in, in, in here, but has one issue, and the issue is that when you look at um, the question of recovering uh, A from a Psi, so you want to, you know F, uh, from F you want to recover A, and you want to put this A into, uh, into this uh, equation in here, and then try to solve this equation, when you do this, you have, uh, if you want, some bad uh, high frequency with paired with high frequencies going to low frequency interactions. Um, and that causes, caused the Joaquin in particular considerable uh, headache, okay? And uh, so one way to, to remedy this, um, and this is where the caloric gauge comes in, uh, is uh, in the work of Tao. So Tao was, was the first one to, to suggest uh, this uh, um, caloric gauge, uh, though he did not use it for, for the proof of his uh, small data result. This came later. Uh, but uh, he used it eventually for the proof of uh, the uh, large data result into the hyperbolic space. And how does this uh, uh, caloric gauge work? Uh, it works in the following way. So you take the corresponding uh, a parabolic equation, and the parabolic equation is dt of phi is equal to d alpha d alpha of phi, okay? With your initial data phi of t, of phi of s, let me use s for the parabolic time, phi of s, let's say, is equal to zero, uh, and x is equal to phi zero of x. You solve this equation globally. There is a version of the threshold conjecture that's true for this uh, uh, equation. So you have a threshold theorem in here. So uh, the threshold theorem again says that below the ground state energy, you can solve this equation globally in time. This threshold theorem is a theorem of tau when you look at targets which are the hyperbolic space and 
uh, than work of Smith when you look at maybe compact targets. Um, there, although there was work uh, uh, before on this problem, maybe I should mention Struve, and many, many other people actually work on, on, uh, on this corresponding parabolic problem. But uh, that's not all you need to do to solve this parabolic problem, because now you want to use this parabolic problem to find a way to provide a good assignment for A at the initial time. So if I'm to make a picture in here, <clears throat> The picture is like this. So you start with t is equal to zero. You have some initial data in here. And you want to solve the hyperbolic equation, right? Now, at each hyperbolic time, you solve a heat equation, the corresponding heat equation. And this s, you let it go all the way to uh, infinity, all right? And what you're going to observe at infinity so here you have some, uh, and, and, and you do this at every time in here, I should say. So for each uh, wave data at time t, phi of t, uh, as s goes to infinity, this will converge to, to, to a constant, to a point. Let me call this point p on the manifold. That's because it's a parabolic equation. It's dissipative, so all the energy goes away. And you're left with a constant solution, all right? And now, uh, at this point, P, it's very easy to find an orthonormal frame, right? You choose your favorite orthonormal frame. This point, P, will be the same here uh, and, and, and throughout, right? So I'm going to choose my orthonormal frame here. So here, I'm going to choose frame, OK? And then, the next thing I do, once I have the frame at this endpoint, is I'm going to parallel transport the frame back to time zero. And this way, I'm going to get a frame at time zero. So the parallel transport equation simply means that you uh, choose a0 is equal to zero, or maybe a, let me use the notation as, the parabolic uh, part of a is equal to zero. And then you come back and you get a good frame uh, at time zero. And this frame has many properties in common with the uh, Coulomb gauge, but has the favorable property that uh, it removes this bad high-high-low interaction. So the reason you introduce a, a caloric flow in here is to remove such a, a bad interaction in your multilinear analysis. All right, so this picture, I'm going to keep it because this picture will still carry over to the Young-Mills equation. And so in the remaining minutes, I want to tell you a little bit about the corresponding caloric gauge for the Young-Mills equation which is, uh, I think, a little bit more interesting than, uh, than in the case of, uh, of the wave map equation. Right. Um, well, um, so uh, basically that's because uh, uh, if you start with a constant solution, uh, it will not move, constant data, it will not move, right? So if you start uh, with, uh, let's say, a nice initial data phi, which is essentially constant at infinity, constant means close to a point, uh, then because of the finite speed of propagation, the solution will stay close, close to the same point P at infinity. And everything else goes away because of the dissipation. So in the end, you'll retain the, this point P, which is the original value at infinity of your map. OK. Um, all right, so now coming to the Young-Mills equation, you have the, um, let, let, me, let me write uh, quickly um, how this equation looks like uh, if you expand it a little bit. So before gauge fixing, uh, your Young-Mills equation looks like d alpha uh, d alpha uh, a beta is equal to d, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, the beta, the alpha, a alpha plus maybe a, d a, 
plus a q. Uh, so this is before fixing the gauge. So you can see from, from this expression that if you want to uh, uh, fix the gauge and get a nice equation, basically you have to do something that gets rid of this term in here. And so there are several interesting gauges. And I should say, when you try to look at uh, a gauge for, for any of these equations, really, your first objective should be the following. You want to choose the gauge so that the nonlinearity becomes perturbative, right? Um, so then you can do perturbative theory. But this uh, strategy doesn't work. Doesn't work for uh, wave maps, doesn't work for young males. So then you're left with a number of competing goals, if you want. Uh, and among these competing goals, you can, I can add uh, causality. You want to have something that has finite speed of propagation. Uh, you want to have your equation to have a, a good structure. And in previous talks, you have heard, uh, let's say, from Sebastian about null structure. So you want your equation to have a good uh, null structure. And most important of all, if you want to have a, a gauge that helps you prove a threshold theorem, you need to have a gauge that works for large data. So you, you care about causality. Null structure, and also about large data. And there are several traditional gauges for this problem. The, the obvious gauge you'd come up with is the Lorentz gauge. Uh, and so, so you simply ask that d alpha, a alpha, is equal to zero. That simply kills this term outright, and you're left with a second order hyperbolic system for a. Uh, the downside of this uh, Lorentz gauge is uh, that you lose this uh, null structure. Um, so it's, it's much harder to do if you want multilinear analysis on the equation. Um, another useful gauge uh, is uh, the temporal gauge. Uh, and the temporal gauge um, is, uh, is to set uh, a naught is equal to zero, the time component uh, to be equal to zero. And then you end up with some sort of uh, uh, div curl structure. Um, so you, uh, for a divergence of A, uh, you're going to have a transport equation. And for the curl of A, you're going to have a wave equation. And the problem with this temporal gauge is that if you try to solve things at critical uh, regularity or for large time, which is the same thing, then the, this transport equation is not good for any sort of decay. So, so you lose there. Another gauge that's useful is the uh, uh, Coulomb gauge. <clears throat> and the Coulomb gauge is dj aj is equal to 0. Morally, this is equivalent to, 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 uh, to the temporal gauge, because if you impose the Coulomb gauge, then a naught is elliptically determined. If you impose the uh, temporal gauge, then divergence of A solves a different equation. So there's some relation between these two. And the Coulomb gauge is the gauge that uh, I have used in the work uh, with the Joaquin Grieger on the small data problem. And for the threshold theorem, we first try to understand whether the uh, Coulomb gauge works. Um, so, so the problem that seems to be with the Coulomb gauge, and we cannot prove this, but this is our intuition, is that it does not work all the way to uh, to, the, uh, to the threshold. And the reason it doesn't seem to work uh, all the way to the threshold is the following. Um, one object that comes up in this story is the covariant elliptic operator. And this is coercive, and you can invert. But when you try to implement the Coulomb gauge, um, you also need to solve the linearized equation associated to the Coulomb gauge, right? Every time you try to solve a PD, it's a good idea that you can solve also the corresponding linearized equation. And uh, so, so uh, maybe I should have said that this is dj, dj. But for the Coulomb gauge to make sense, you also need to solve uh, the following equation associated to this elliptic operator, dj, dj. Um, and this does not seem to be invertible all the way up to this uh, uh, threshold. Uh, so that's one issue. Another way, well, there's more ways. So if anybody is curious about this, I can say more. Uh, in any case, so this, the Coulomb gauge, our intuition is that it doesn't work all the way to the threshold. And then we want to introduce this uh, um, uh, caloric gauge. 
And let me show you how the caloric gauge works. And I'm going to try to reuse this picture. Um, where is the eraser? So here, the time t, I have some uh, a of t. Uh, I take the corresponding uh, caloric equation. And the caloric equation is f s uh, k is equal to d j f j k. So you introduce uh, uh, a parabolic time component of uh, the connection, and this is the curvature with one parabolic component and one spatial component. So this is a covariant formulation of a parabolic equation. And this is where I was telling you that you also need to worry about gauges for this problem. Because it has the very same invariance, gauge invariance, as your young males equation. And there are two gauges that are of interest here. So one gauge has, has to do with the following goal. You're trying to think of this as a parabolic equation, so when you implement your gauge condition, you want your equation to be a strongly parabolic equation. And then you end up with something that's called the de Turk gauge. All right, the de Turk gauge is very simple, is A naught is equal to dj aj. Hopefully I got the sign right. Um, and if you implement this gauge, you can write this as a parabolic equation for, a strongly parabolic equation for the AJs. The problem is this parabolic equation, we have no idea whether it has global solutions or not. And the reason we don't know whether it has global solutions or not is because in particular to solve this problem, one needs to be able to consider trivial data with zero curvature. If you take an initial data with zero curvature, so A is of the form O, A alpha is O alpha, O inverse, and you implement this the third gauge, what you're going to get is a young males equation which takes values uh, into, uh, into the group G. And this will be a four-dimensional young males equation, four plus one-dimensional young males equation. It will be a supercritical problem. How do you know that you can solve that equation below a certain threshold energy? No idea, okay? So this the third gauge is good from a parabolic standpoint, but very bad from a hyperbolic standpoint for getting global solutions. And um, so I, I know that I'm kind of out of time, but I'll take five more minutes just to finish the story. Um, so. Uh, the, the gauge that my collaborator, uh, Sanjin uh, Oh, introduced uh, in three-dimensional problems is what he calls the local caloric gauge. And this simply asks for the uh, parabolic time component of, uh, of the gauge to be equal to zero. And if you compare that to this, you see that uh, at least formally it's the same choice of gauge that uh, Tao made for the uh, um, for the wave map, for the corresponding wave map problem. Um, but, but here things get a little bit more complicated. And maybe the best comparison is not so much with, uh, is also with what Tao chose for uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, corresponding wave map problem, but there's also an interesting parallel to, uh, to the work of, of Perelman for the Ricci flow, where there's a similar choice of, uh, of gauge, although he doesn't refer to it in this way, which uh, plays a role in, in his story. All right, so to make a long story short, if you choose this local caloric gauge, then you can prove a corresponding threshold theorem for this caloric flow. And this is a very interesting theorem. Naively, it says the same thing uh, as here, which is that below the ground state energy, you have global solutions. But this is a very interesting equation. And let me, let me tell you one feature that's, that's most interesting about it, in my view. In, in PDs, we try to classify equations in, uh, say, nonlinear equations into semilinear, quasi-linear, and so on. When you talk about a semilinear equation, you think of something where you have Lipschitz dependence on the data. When you talk about the quasi-linear equation, you're thinking of a setup where you have only continuous dependence on the initial data. Now, when you have Lipschitz dependence on the data, I think, well, I can solve the problem with the fixed point arguments, I'll actually get C infinity dependence on the initial data. Well, when you solve this equation in the local calorie gauge, something very interesting happens. You do get Lipschitz dependence on the data, okay? So it's semi-linear, right? 
uh, but you don't have C2 dependence on the data. So it, it breaks down exactly at, uh, at the C1 level. That's uh, what, uh, the, what, what we see. And, and the reason for that is when you look at the linearized equation, you cannot solve this linear equation directly perturbatively. The linear, linearized equation is still a covariant equation. And you have to solve that equation as a covariant equation. And so you cannot uh, f reiterate, you cannot solve this uh, 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 iteratively. Okay, so that much about this uh, uh, this flow. But now, what happens on this picture? So this is uh, the end of my story. <clears throat> because now, so I start from here, my initial data, and I do this at every time. I solve the parabolic equation globally, and here I don't get something that's constant. And the reason I, I don't get something that's constant is because in this local caloric gauge, our equation will no longer be strongly parabolic. It will have more like a splitting like this, a diff curl splitting, okay? And so uh, the curl, which is the curvature, will go to zero, but the divergence will not go to zero. And so here you're going to get uh, some A of infinity, okay? This A of infinity might still move as a function of time. So again, it's not constant. But what this A of infinity has uh, is that its curvature, which is part of the, um, um, the curl equation, which, which is strongly parabolic, um, is zero. So, and so if at time infinity you have a, a, a flat connection, okay, then this A must be renormalizable to zero. So it must be of the form O A alpha, O alpha, O inverse, okay? And then uh, you can take the entire solution from here to here and apply uh, this uh, gauge transformation governed by this O. And so when you do this, you get zero here and you get a non-zero here. So you map this to zero and you map this to some A tilde of zero in this case which is a special kind of state for uh, initial data state, which is mapped to zero uh, by, the, uh, by the parabolic flow. And then we call this the, a, a caloric state. Uh, these caloric states, they live on what, something that we call a caloric manifold. And so we solve the uh, young mills equation on this caloric manifold. And the very last observation that I wanted to make, uh, which has to do with the connection between this caloric manifold and the Coulomb gauge. So I was telling you that the Coulomb gauge is a good thing, right? Except it doesn't work globally. Well, this caloric manifold functions on this manifold satisfies some sort of generalized Coulomb gauge. And this generalized Coulomb has the form um, uh, dj aj uh, is equal to, so we'd like this to be zero for Coulomb, it's not zero, and you have two components in here. Um, you have a bilinear form in A and A, which is explicit, uh, maybe a plus something that's trilinear uh, and higher in A, and this guy is not explicit, but satisfies very good estimates. So to end the, the story here, you end up using explicitly this bilinear structure in here, which has to do with null conditions and so on in the hyperbolic equation, whereas everything that's higher order gets treated perturbatively. All right, and I already kept you too long, so I'm going to stop here. There was a lot more to say, but...